Yeah, I am so thrilled to see the room fall, and I just want to thank you all for being with us tonight. I want to introduce myself and give you a little map for how tonight is going to run. So on Barbly Savoy, I am interim chair of Women and Gender Studies, a gig that feels very familiar. I want to say very familiar, a position that I was in for 13 years and um, stepped away as chair, and our current chair is on sabbatical. So I'm thrilled to be back at the helm and um, filling in for them and sort of still trying to get you know, my feet in and dig into to this workload. So just um, to give you a little map for tonight. So I'm Barbara Savoy, as I said. I am facilitating tonight's talk. I am the faculty member for feminist theory, and I'm thrilled to see my feminist theory students with us tonight. I'm also really, really thrilled, as I learned during our pizza reception, that we have with us tonight the Anthropology Club. Hoo hoo. So thanks so much for joining us there because we have a big intersection with anthropology tonight. And just a shout out um, to our Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Dean Malieko. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming tonight. We're always thrilled when we have our, our bosses or our administrators with us because they get to see the really cool stuff that we're doing in our faculty work and in our classrooms, and most importantly, get to see our students as they are um, interacting with us in the classroom. So um, I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a second. Just want to give you a map for how we've choreographed tonight's talk. So we also have this live streaming. So I should have said important people. Thank you so much to Mike Smith. Um, over to my right over there, Mike, standing with your student assistant through the Department of Communication and Media Studies um, in live streaming this. And that's a really important piece of this. We have an audience that is uh, listening from afar. They can't interact with us, but they can. Sorry, I've got to remember to um, be closer to the mic. Um, but they can um, hear everything that's going on. So thank you, Mike, for allowing us um, the privilege of doing that so that we're able to um, reach a, a larger audience than just those who are able to be with us physically. But we're so glad to be with the people here face to face. So the talk will run. I want to say like we've choreographed this, Yelena and I, and we've sort of rehearsed and practiced and conversed about it as best we could. And we um, think that the talk will run about an hour is what we've um, figured. And then we'll close after that hour with a Q&A. And that will give you an opportunity to ask questions. And I also have some questions that are generating on the live stream. I've got a couple of students that are looking at that. Kay? Uh, I don't have the live stream. OK, well, we'll figure that out at the end. I'll get it up, try and get that up for the live stream. We'll, We'll make it work. Um, we've got lots of questions that my students have already posed on Brightspace, so I've got that. And I've got a whole slew of questions as well. So we think that that will run about an hour, and then we'll um, have our Q&A and be on our way. And we're, I'm just so excited for tonight's talk. So just a bio introduction that doesn't do enough justice, but just to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Yamana Sangarasavam is a professor of anthropology and a director of women and gender studies at Nazareth College, which is right down the road in Rochester, New York. Yamana received her undergraduate training in musicology with piano as her principal instrument in the School of Music at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. She continued her studies in performing arts in the Department of Dance at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she studied the intersections of gender and sexuality in Odissi dance and Indian classical dance form. While she was a graduate student at UCLA, she had the extraordinary opportunity to participate in a Michael Jackson music video project. 
Yamana dances in a duet with Michael Jackson in his mu music video, Black or White, titled Black or White. So that's you know a whole nother talk, right? Like that's not tonight, but we'll invite you back for that. After completing the Masters of Arts in Dance Ethno Ethnology, she completed her PhD, sorry, I lost my place for a second. She completed her PhD in Cultural and Political Anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at Syracuse University's Maxwell School for Citizenship and Public Affairs. Her interdisciplinary training continues to inform her studies and teaching in critical terrorism studies, a question that I'll be asking um, and we'll be talking about tonight, critical security studies, nationalism, terrorism, and resistance, intersectionalities of race, class, gendered identities, national, transnational identities, sexualities and divergent abilities, anthropology of dance, critical diversity studies, food and culture, and decolonizing pedagogies. That is probably the most interdisciplinary scholar that I've ever had the privilege and honor to introduce. So that pretty much crosses so many I's and T's that is women and gender studies. So I should have mentioned um, something about me. <laughs> is that I must read from my notes. If I don't read, I'll keep you here much too long. Um, the reading allows me to organize myself, and I have penned out some of our opening discussion questions, and that's to make sure that I don't lose my place because I otherwise could. So I'm gonna take a seat, um, and I'm gonna grab the mic, and we'll begin our discussion. Yam and I are gonna talk first. I'm then gonna invite her to the podium to do a reading. She'll come back down, I'm gonna ask her another question, and she'll conclude with a reading from her slides, and that's how tonight's gonna to go. Um, let me grab my mic. And I probably should have also mentioned that in some ways as we have this conversation, it's been just, um, yikes, Mike, is that me? I have some. I've already, I've already done something disruptive. I'm not even trying. <laughs> is that all right? Yeah. OK. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me? Is that OK? Can you, and you, can you guys hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. OK, yeah, I was raised by someone who screamed while talking. So I'm pretty good at doing that. I sort of picked that up as a kid. My daughter does it. Um, but if for any reason my mask is an obstacle for anyone, just pipe in and say, Barb, talk a little louder. Um, but I wanted to just say before I ask the you know, first question is that the first question is for Yamana to tell us a bit about her backstory um, and what is the backstory for her book. I just want to hold up her book um, that I've had the privilege of, of reading. And I should have said as part of my introduction that Yamana and I served as co-reviewers, um, something that we do in academia. Um, to review the Women and Gender Studies program at SUNY Geneseo, and that was a year ago. And we discovered one another, and what we discovered about one another is that we have this affinity and sort of connection and wonderful friendship that has evolved from that, right? And I think that's sort of an interesting piece of this dialogue that we're about to have is that, um, I'm sitting next to my colleague who's remarkable, but I'm also really honored now to call you a friend. Thank you. So Yamana, welcome. And so I want to open our conversation by saying, please, by asking or you know, talking about an opportunity for you to give us a bit of your backstory that is the backbone for your book. So being in Sri Lanka with your mom, your inside lens here, that's an important part of the story that you tell in your book. And really what I, what I um, am interested in is the politic of space that constitutes your story. And in the same vein, I'm also asking you to comment a bit on your family origins as Tamil and your transnational identity as this unravels in Sri Lanka and here in the US. And you know, as you're talking with me, I'll probably have a few more questions to ask. But let's get started on that note. OK, absolutely. Barb, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. And back 
um, and Women and Gender Studies Anthropology students. Such an honor and a pleasure to join you here at um, SUNY Brockport um, and a wonderful opportunity to share my work uh, and the publication of this book project, which um, is a culmination of 30 years of work. It's a long, long haul. It's a long project um, with lots of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and, um, and so much of it, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to so many people that made it possible, especially my parents, my family members, my sister, my brother, um, and so many um, Tamil community members whom, uh, unfortunately, I can't name in person due to the political um, uh, uh, violence that continues in Sri Lanka and for Tamil community members who are uh, persecuted and also in the Tamil diaspora. So um, please forgive me for uh, those who I cannot name uh, just to be um, conscientious of their safety, which brings us to, um, to some of the questions later on about um, ethnographic methodology and research methodologies in the social sciences. So my backstory, Barb. Um, uh, I uh, am Yamuna. I am born in uh, Yalpanam, uh, Tamil Ulam, northern Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, at the time of my birth, my parents were living in North Borneo, Malaysia. Um, and so I identify myself as a third generation transnational because my grandparents on both sides, my, parent, uh, my dad and my mom's side, they migrated to Malaysia um, and Singapore um, uh, during the British colonial regime and worked as administrative offices in the colonial regime in um, Singapore, where my dad was born, and in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where my mom was born. And so um, after the Second World War, um, we, uh, they, they moved uh, back to Sri Lanka, and my grandparents retired. And my parents continued their education, um, finishing high school. And then um, my dad went on to medical school um, in Calcutta um, uh, or Kolkata, uh, India. And um, so he finished uh, his veterinary training, came back to Sri Lanka to serve, um, uh, advanced in his career to become chief veterinary um, uh, surgeon and officer in the districts that he served in the north and east. And as this is happening, um, uh, they were married in 1957. Daddy had been serving just prior to that, coming back from his training in India. Um, there is political um, unrest that is unraveling um, in the post-colonial reality of Sri Lanka, like so many places. So um, there was the 1956 um, anti-Tamil uh, riots. Um, this is on the heels of uh, legislation which is, which is part of the history of Sri Lanka. There's a series of constitutional legislations that discriminated and marginalized Tamil community members. So there are two major language um, speaking groups in Sri Lanka. The Singhala speaking people largely in the south um, and uh, west and uh, historically the homelands of the north and east were uh, the Tamil speaking people. And so I'm from the north in the northern peninsula in Yalpanam or Jaffna in English. Um, so uh, in 1956 there was a singular only language policy. So um, my dad serving as a, as a veterinary surgeon um, just like you know, many of us in our professions, we'll receive memos or um, communications. Uh, they were coming in three languages, uh, Singhala, Tamil, and English. And literally overnight, um, everything changed so that it was only Singhala language. So, um, so you know, in, in terms of administrative work or just carrying on with one's profession, that became a problem because you had to pass an English or a singular proficiency exam in order to maintain your job. And so, um, you know, so it was situations like this then that forced them to leave again. Uh, in addition to that, there was um, state-sponsored organized violence that were called, quote unquote, riots. So there was the 1958 riots that they, that they, um, that they, they witnessed and um, they had to flee from. 
um, these kinds of state-sponsored riots would continue um, almost every decade until 1983, which was one of the largest um, uh, state-sponsored violence that, uh, from which the Tamil nationalist movement emerged. So um, that reality of, um, of, and you know, there's so much more in terms of the history of Sri Lanka that intersects with the everyday lives of people like my, my family and my parents. Um, that you know that tells that tells this larger story, but then with variations in terms of forced migration and family members um, that have uh, arrived in North America and uh, in Europe and Australia. So, um, one of the one of the legislations was um, called the uh, in 1973 was called the standardization policy that required college students. Um, Tamil, uh, with a Tamil identity, to score higher on college entrance exam, but there were fewer seats for them to come into in the freshman or first year class. So education became a really important flashpoint for Tamil community members um, and for family members. And so education was like so central to our identity to persevere. Um, and that's uh, and, and that became um, a, a, a mobilizing um, uh, tool for the Tamil nationalist movement, but it also became a mobilizing tool for families to make the difficult choice to leave their homelands and their home countries. Many of my father's colleagues had sent their kids to boarding schools in, in the UK, and um, mom and dad decided that they did not want to do that. So um, they left Sri Lanka, or they left North Borneo, and um, uh, we came back to Sri Lanka for two years, and Daddy came up, came to, uh, to the United States, started all over again as a graduate student, and, um, and all for us, because they wanted to make sure that we had a future and we had the opportunity for higher education. Yeah. So that's um, that's a part of that's a really important part of my um, backstory, which brings me to where I am today. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting as we read your prologue to sort of you know read into what that journey was like, um, and how this informs your your work. So I want to jump in um, and sort of move forward and talk to you a bit. It sort of relates to your. Um, your backstory and a bit about your transnational identity and navigating that transnational identity. And I want to talk for a minute, Yamana, about your method um, that comes across in your, in your book, um, your interviews, and your participant observing role in the movements that you were recording. And you've mentioned these, um, these emerging times of conflict or emerging and re-emerging times of conflict. You speak about ways your own identity impacts your research, an important piece of ethnography, ways you are seen but not seen. And I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about this. Um, and I'm interested in talking a bit, something that you know, we talk about a lot in women and gender studies and comes out in theory, although we're very new to the semester in theory, but this notion of belonging and not belonging, looking in and being inside, right, and seeing things from inside and then looking from the outside, um, belonging and not belonging and national belonging and um, I just have a note here when we, we spoke last night, this notion about being killed um, and killing, right? So all of that is sort of embedded into this, um, into this question. Um, and even here, as I look out of, uh, around the room, we have this sense of belonging, right? And not belonging, we're coming into the room, we're entering to this discourse as listeners, we're engaging, we're trying to you know, have a conversation, right? And so that also brings out this question of belonging. I also wanna say that Yamana, um, when you opened up, you mentioned you know, a welcome and you mentioned my colleague back. You know, what an oversight on my part. You know, I mentioned my, my dean, 
Jane, uh, which is, of course, really important, right? Um, but so important is my colleague, um, Dr. Beck Orr, um, and um, so, so, you know, we're a small department, but important to recognize her. So, Yamana, yeah, um, so much there um, for you to um, talk with us about. Thank you, thank you. Really, really meaningful question, um, Barb. So anthropology and ethnographic methodology, that is the, that is the sort of cornerstone um, and signature research, qualitative research methodology for, um, for anthropologists that is, um, has now transcended um, into um, uh, other disciplines um, from economics to philosophy to, of course, interdisciplinary programs like women and gender studies, American studies, um, uh, uh, African American studies. Uh, so ethnographic methodology requires us, and anthropologists in the room, you guys will, will, will find this familiar, it requires us to engage in field work. Normally in grad school we're required to engage in at least um, one academic year. Um, in, in a field site we learn um, the, uh, the language, um, uh, our comprehensive exams are about the history and um, the, uh, setting the context for our research. But what's curious about it is that um, uh, anthropology, and this is why I came into the discipline um, as well, uh, although you know, musicology and dance ethnology, these are anthropology of music, anthropology of dance, and so it, was, it, was, it, was, it made sense for me to arrive at, at anthropology proper. But as a discipline, anthropology is deeply embedded in colonial history. Um, so, you know, from Margaret Mead and, and Gregory Bateson and others um, who were intimately involved with the U.S. State Department and the CIA, um, and up until the present with the Human Terrain Project, um, where anthropologists are embedded with soldiers into um, theaters of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, Djibouti, and other places. So we, it's, it's a discipline that's fraught with this history of, um, of, of complicity uh, with um, colonial regimes and, um, and imperial wars and imperial interventions. And as a discipline, what's fabulous about it is that we have the capacity to look face to, to face it and confront it straight on and to have intense debates within the American Anthropological Association. So with feminist anthropologists, with the um, Association for Black Anthropologists, um, there are rigorous conversations and even with the rise of the Human Terrain Project, there was, uh, there was, you know, there were town hall after town halls and, and, uh, and the association came down with a statement that, um, that, uh, that spoke against it. Um, so, uh, historically, and even in the, in the present, if we really stop to think about it, um, North American scholars and European scholars have the, um, like, uh, an unquestioned right, just by the, just by dint of our passports, to walk into <laughs> practically any country and set up shop and start observing the natives. We don't call them the natives perhaps anymore, but we call them interlocutors. I don't know, you can, we, can, we can name it, but still there is that privilege that we hold as quote unquote First Nation state citizens um, or residents. And so this is a, this is a conundrum that, that, that continues. And black feminist anthropologists like Faye Harrison, um, Irma McLaren, and others have, um, and, and black feminist scholars have called into question bell hooks. We're going to be talking about you, your, uh, your readings of bell hooks about our subject position and social location. Again, this is part of feminist um, methodologies that is informing uh, ethnographic methodologies, where reflexivity, where the researcher is required to um, to reveal uh, their subject position and social location. Um, who are we? Why are we here? Why are we asking these questions? What allows us to be here? What are the relationships of power um, that allows us to be here? So those differential relations of power still c 
continue to manifest. Um, and that's something that I experienced throughout my um, graduate studies, undergraduate studies, and even until un through the point of bringing this book out into the world. And I have to pause for a minute and really acknowledge um, Marie Yanao and um, Mary Al Said at Palgrave Macmillan. They both moved on now from Palgrave, but at the time that they were there and they saw the value of my work and um, invited me to publish with Palgrave. And even until almost the last last phase of the publication, when you know the final um, the book went out for the final reviews, so one reviewer came back as very positive, this is great. Um, another reviewer came back and, and, and had detailed responses and comments, but in the end um, advised Paul Grave not to publish the book. So it was, it was because of Mary Al Said and her foresight and her confidence and her understanding the work and understanding um, the, 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 back, the back story of publishing, the back story of how people of color are recruited, even as grad students or as scholars, even when we arrive at full professor, we're still seen um, with this colonial lens as we are the key informants or um, you know, the, the modern noble savage, if you will, um, where, you know, um, academia wants our stories, our lived experiences, but they don't want our analysis. Not interested. I, I, I'll, I'll never forget, it's seared in my memory. When I was in um, grad school, I came back from Sri Lanka after this rigorous, rigorous um, fieldwork experience. Um, my mom traveled with me. And um, you know, one of my faculty in the anthropology program um, wanted to know, you know, how many hours of recordings do you have? Um, this was the, the, the first question. Like that was the measure of success, right? How many hours of recordings do you have of interviews? Um, and then, you know, once I started writing my dissertation, then you know, the the other feedback that I got from faculty is like, you know, there's too much theory, there's too much analysis here. We want more of your stories. This is precisely what feminist anthropologists are, black feminist anthropologists are writing about, where our lived experiences are not recognized, are not seen, sure. but we are only seen um, as racialized people, and then you know intersecting that with with race. Uh, and class and national identities. And then so those of us who are carrying transnational identities are also, you know, especially having to um, uh, straddle these multiple spheres, but then end up existing in this kind of liminal space where we are simultaneously embraced, but also seen as perpetual visitors. Um, to this day, I'm, I'm asked whether, I, you know, at, at Nazareth, you know, am I a, are, are you a visiting student? Are you, a vis are you an international yeah. student? Are, um, or, you know, in, in, in more difficult circumstances where, you know, I assume that I have a seat at the table. And again, Faye Harrison, Irma McLaurin write about this. We step into um, uh, academic meetings or, um, you know, uh, uh, department meetings or and if when we speak from our lived experience in our classrooms even um, then you know it's it's seen as suspect or is seen as aggression or um, it's I, I've, I've, I've been told that when I raise critical questions that it is received as ad hominem attacks yeah I mean I also want to say that there's the double um, the double-edged sword so to speak of you know that scrutiny um, and what we see is like marked identity versus dominant identity right yes. so you can sort of be in that dominant space and not be questioned and then there is the marked or visible aspects of identity that then put that questioning onto your shoulder. And I, um, I mentioned in you know, one of the last questions, but I'll raise it now, um, and you, know, you, you mentioned bell hooks. And we read bell hooks last week, um, theory as liberatory practice in our theory class. One of the things that hooks, who we lost in December 2021, um, mentions in that theory as liberatory practice is you know this notion of theorizing 
are bringing meaning to what we live, right? And how important it is as readers of theory to see ourselves in the text, and then how important it is to bring our lived experiences into that text, because that authenticates the knowledge that we know from having lived that, right? And that sort of emerges so prominently in your work um, and really resonated with me as I was reading your book. Um, so it, just a comment, really, as you were talking about that. Um, Thank you. And one of those, one of, if I may share it with regard to the, the methodology um, question. So um, when I did the field work, this was in 1994, 95, and then 2003, and 2005, and then 2015, and then 2019. So all, all of these phases of, of research. But in 94 and 95, it was still the, uh, a, a, a period of war between the Tamil nationalist movement, um, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam, and the Sri Lankan government. So my identity as a transnational manifested in, the, in, in these ways. So you know, I set up my research um, agenda and program, meeting with um, scholars from the University of Colombo. Um, I also, um, uh, with Maxwell School's um, conflict resolution program, my initial question uh, for research was on the question of neutrality and conflict resolution. And so um, I had worked with Peace Brigades International. And so I actually was a international observer with peace brigades, which created a lot of controversy within peace brigades, because how can a Sri Lankan Tamil woman be, but wait a second, she's a US passport holder, so she should be allowed. So there was a lot of questions. So there's another example of yeah. this liminal space. Okay. And then, um, then when I arrived in, in Sri Lanka, um, I was recruited by Dr. Neelan Thirachavam to um, this a really extraordinary honor and opportunity to be a research fellow um, in the, at the uh, uh, Center for International uh, Ethnic um International St Center for um, Ethnic Studies. Um, I might be getting that wrong. Um, uh, I'll have to look at my notes for a second. But um, so uh, while I was there, um, Dr. Thirchelvam, you know, was a great mentor. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy was a wonderful mentor as well. And yet, I found that I was one of the um, few people, and at that time, the only person who, who uh, was a, a Tamil um, transnational uh, whose um, place of birth was from uh, uh, Yalpanam and in the north and still had deep connections. Our ancestral home is there. We were returning home. And I was going to be going to the north um, for six months of that research. So, and I've, I've published um, elsewhere about this experience. So while I was um, at ICES, um, uh, uh, I um, came to know later on while I was, uh, while I had traveled to the north and had gone back home to our, uh, to our home and to work with uh, uh, and to study with the movement that I was, um, the story that circulated in Colombo was that I was, uh, a, I was going to be a Patricia Hearst that would come back to assassinate Dr. Thiruchelvam. Why? Because the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam, um, suicide bombing was part of their um, practice of um, asymmetric warfare. So, um, so while we were in Colombo, um, the, you know, somebody in the neighborhood, or we don't know who, would uh, report it on us. And like at three in the morning, um, a military brigade came and surrounded the apartment that we lived in. We were woken up. We were separated into rooms. I mean, anything could have happened. These were these are conditions of war. Sure. This is not something that you can record in a in a in an audio tape. So these kinds of lived experiences become part of what Bell Hooks sure, is, is, sure. is talking about. Absolutely. And when you spoke about uh, the gratitude to Palgrave Macmillan, I also want to invoke something that's true that um, 
you know, resonated for me is this notion of legitimizing our voices as feminist scholars, as anthropologists, as um, researchers, right? And that, um, that process becomes a little bit more challenging when we introduce transnational identities and unconventional research methodologies or different research methodologies, right? Bell Hooks talks about, and I've experienced this, so I can say it's true for me, um, talks about this um, question of legitimizing her own voice. Like, am I really an author? Did I really write that? Is that really my work, right? And are people really, you know, recognizing me for my scholarship? And so it's sort of that scrutiny becomes that much more amplified. And it is, you know, something that you eventually grow into, right? You grow into this voice of, I am a scholar, I am a researcher. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is, it, it's, it's challenging. Um, so so you know when when I'm when I when I went when we went north with my mom, um, Amma accompanied me, which was a great honor and a privilege. She ha has and always will be my mentor. My parents have both left the planet. I trust that they are here and and um, in in presence and in in our presence today. But Amma. Um, uh, and I, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 that, was a, that was a very unique um, opportunity because at that time in 94 and 95, it, there were very few people that had the opportunity to actually travel through the war zones, travel through the military checkpoints, um, through the no man's land and into the territory that was, um, that was de facto uh, um, ruled by the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam. And so it, it took months of preparation in the diaspora, working with um, activists in the, uh, in, in the UK, in Canada, and in the United States. So it's a multi-sided ethnography that then allowed me to prepare to go back home. Sure. And so, you know, even once having arrived home, that that sense of seen and and not being seen, you know, continues. Sure. That liminal space continues, um, because when we arrived home, refugees were placed in our home that we shared um, the space with, and when we arrived there, even though they knew who we were, that this is our house, they would continue to ask us, "So, where are you from?" Sure. And you know, so which is still which is, like you have to authenticate you yourself. You have to authenticate over and over again. Yeah. But then, but then, what happens? I, you know, I go to the market, and um, and I'm, you know, I I I go to get our just basic like sugar and flour and rice, and immediately, um, the the store owner says, "You are Arkandeya's granddaughter, are you not?" So. Right? So in that moment is that moment of belonging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's right? such, so meaningful. Right, so as soon as you said, Kandiya Nepeti Ilya, so are you not the grandfather of Kandiya? And I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's so powerful. As you speak it now, it becomes that much more powerful. Yamana. Um, just to move our conversation along, I want to say that one of the things that I love about your book is your integrative narratives of poetry and rock and roll. We heard Pink Floyd, The Wall, as you entered the room this evening. Um, you also, um, I'm especially pulled in by the redaction of text, which are deep sentences that extend your discourse. I know we're going to talk about that redacted text and what that felt like as a reader toward the end of your reading tonight. But if you could just tell us for a moment before you, I'm going to invite Yamana to go up and read in just a few moments. But before you do that, if you could just tell us about these style choices and the meaning and intersection and really the symbolism of using Pink Floyd's The Wall. Fantastic, thank you. Another wonderful, wonderful question. So yes, you were listening to, to Pink Floyd as you guys came into the room. So um, how does Pink Floyd come into this work? 
So um, in one of the chapters, actually all the chapters are, um, uh, are, are titled after the uh, songs from um, Pink Floyd's iconic album. So this album, The Wall, um, is released in 1973, just in the wake of um, the US um, uh, uh, evacuating from Vietnam and Cambodia. So it is, it is, a, uh, it is, a, it is an iconic um, album, it is a concept album that continues to resonate today as long as there are wars um, to help us understand. I was talking to Hunter earlier and, and how you're very, much, um, you're very much a Pink Floyd um, listener and fan and, and, your, and your words, Hunter, was to say that it, that it helps you to interpret and to understand what's happening in our reality. So meaningfully, um, Shaker Amer, who, um, who was uh, ab uh, abducted and detained and rendered to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba by, um, by US military forces and was held there and tortured for over, f over 14 years. He writes about um, how he was listening to the song, Hey You. And he writes a letter that he sends through his lawyers um, uh, uh, who were representing him for his release, um, Clive Owen Smith. And um, that letter was received by Roger Waters um, of Pink Floyd. And there was a large mobilization and solidarity movement to, for his release, for Shaker Amir's release. So, the, um, the, the reality of, uh, of transnational identities, such as Shaker Amer and m my own, intersect in that moment of, um, of finding each other through Pink Floyd. Sure. In the way that so many people found each other with um, Pink Floyd, with Roger Waters, and Shaker Amer. And so there's this whole section in an analysis of, um, of Hey You, um, of, uh, of um, Goodbye Blue Sky, that is, that is a part of the book that uh, is an analysis of the arrival of drones um, in Afghanistan and the use of drones, drone warfare. And I make the connection in terms of how, um, when I say we, um, and you'll hear me talk about those pronouns um, in just a few moments, how we deploy drones and they deploy suicide bombers. And so this understanding of of how music um, and uh, the music of Pink Floyd, particularly The Wall, speaks to the experiences of war, resonating back and forth from World War II into Cambodia, into Afghanistan, into Iraq. And so that album is going to, um, is going to stay present f with us for quite some time. Redaction happens um, in, the, in so many um, uh, examples of poetry uh, that informed my work, um, particularly Claudia Rankin's Citizen, um, M. Norbs v. Phillips, uh, Zong. And, and again, I have to pause for a moment. I have to um, acknowledge uh, Chris, Dr. Kristen Prevele, um, a colleague and a friend who opened the door to poetry. I didn't know that poetry resided within me. <laughs> and she invited and pulled out all this poetry. And when I was talking about speculative, um, uh, a kind of speculative method, what I really wanted to, what I imagined was, what would it look like to have Tamil nationalist movement members speaking with Shekhar Amir, speaking with US military soldiers, speaking with Afghan um, uh, uh, civilians, speaking with um, a, a, a female cadre from the Tamil nationalist movement um, who is preparing for suicide. Uh, so how would we do that? And, and how would we bring those voices together? And so. Um, she, uh, uh, Kristen, opened the door to poetry, introduced me to Claudia Rankin, introduced me to Laylee Long Soldier, and, um, and meaningfully, um, another person that was, uh, that was detained and abducted and rendered to Guantanamo um, Bay, Cuba, was um, Mohamedou Aoudslahi, and he writes um, 
uh, over 400 pages in a, in a, in a diary um, that was then finally published as the Guantanamo Diary. But over 2,000, um, there were over 2,500 redactions that were made by the US Department of State and the US military of this text. There's a film that was that came out um, called The Mauritanian um, that's based on yeah, his yeah. life on, uh, yeah. on his life story. So redactions become a way of, of course, erasure in the name of national security, in the name of personal security, perhaps. But it also um, it's meaningful because we are confronted with redacted histories, sure. Re uh, both and and redacted lives. Right, ultimately, so entire sections of lives that are redacted. I mean, we're we're facing that right now um, in Florida, for example, and oh, absolutely, and the fear and the anxiety over over um, uh, critical race theory. Sure, <laughs> and right. and someone in my class last week raised the question. Um, it was Lindsay or Lauren, or I, I'm sorry if I have that wrong, um, but whoever. If I have that wrong, please you know hold me accountable. Um, the question of Florida and um, and bell hooks falling on a list of readings that would be barred, right? And so we're talking about bell hooks tonight, and that was an author who was marked for extinction and redaction. Yeah, right. So how we how you know so we can think about redaction. Um, as erasure and what purpose does that serve? Absolutely. And but that erasure reveals something else. Always. Always. I, uh, there are. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this at the end. Um, I want to move us along because I know that um, time is of essence, and I have a note here that we um, should um, be at a slightly more advanced um, place right now. But I do want to say that um, you know when I look at redacted text. I read sentences, right? The moment that we're excluded or pushed aside or can no longer read, that's a sentence. Uh, there's deep meaning there. So Yamana, I want to invite you now to go up and um, read from your book. And I want to ask you a question as you go forward to the podium. Um, you open chapter two with a quote from Sarah Ahmad that I'd like to read if I could, and I'm reading from your um, opening of chapter two, um, A Speculative Ethnography of War is the chapter, and this is Sarah Ahmed's quote. Willfulness is the word used to describe the perverse potential of will and to contain that perversity in a figure. Uh, our tendency to associate willfulness with human flaws and sin would become a symptom not only of the desire to punish the perverts, but to restrict perversion to the conduct of the few. If willfulness provides a constraint for perversion, my aim is to spill this container. And with that, I want to invite you to read, if you could, um, and talk to us a bit more about this willfulness as you embarked on this creative scholarly work that is your story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And again, a very meaningful, um, a very meaningful question. Um, so by way of responding, um, so those that are, those that are um, marginalized or pushed out of or seen as outside of humanity, um, uh, such as insurgents, uh, such as quote unquote terrorists, those who we name by way of naming that we marginalize and push outside of humanity, outside of citizenship. So be that be terrorist, uh, migrant, um, refugee, uh, a statelessness. Um, this, uh, this is, they constitute a willful archive. Their lives and their life stories constitute a willful archive. And that's what drew me to um, Ahmed's um, of, uh, theorization around willfulness. And one thing that she um, also says is, um, this is from her 
from her book, um, Willful Subjects. Willfulness, says Ahmed, is, uh, involves persistence in the face of having been brought down, where simply to keep going or to keep coming up is to be stubborn and obstinate. Mere persistence can be an act of disobedience. And so that's what drew me to to this willful methodology that you will see. So as I'm reading my um, uh, excerpts from my work, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to um, just keep in mind um, some, of, some key concepts. And also, um, I invite you to witness um, the experiences, the lived experiences that I'm sharing um, as, uh, as a feminist, um, anthropologist and uh, person of color. So again, decolonizing anthropology we spoke about earlier from um, Faye Harrison, um, feminist methodologies of reflexivity, politically engaged scholarship. Um, Nancy Shepard Hughes talks about this, that our work as anthropologists is, is, not, um, is not objective and objectivity is not the goal, rather that we, um, we, ha we are ethically bound um, with care and uh, uh, responsibility. We are held accountable for how we represent uh, lived experiences of ourselves and those that we have the honor to learn and work with. Um, that requires us to become politically engaged scholars. And so there is a critique and, and a pushback against um, a, a colonial um, uh, understanding of objectivity. Um, similarly, black feminist anthropologists, um, Irma McLuhan, um, Zora Neale Hurston, um, who only recently was, uh, 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 her book was published, Barracoon, that, that she presented in 1937, but, uh, but publishers would not, um, would, would, would not take up her work because she insisted on presenting um, a, 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 the point of view from her subject position and social location and also in the vernacular of the people that she was speaking with on the history and the experience of enslavement. We talked about redaction um, and speculative ethno uh, ethnology. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, Elizabeth Chin. The idea of specula uh, speculative ethnography and ethnology came from her invitation to join her in, cr in, in a space that, in a liminal space that she created within the American Anthropological Association, Wakanda University at the um, AAA conference in 2018 and 2019. And her work really informed my uh, developing this this um, method uh, of speculative ethnography, which also resonates and emerges out of the work of Octavia Butler and her speculative uh, fiction, um, the poetic form of Teresa Hakung Cha, um, Kristen Prevle again, uh, Lely Long Soldier, um, M. Norsby. Um, uh, uh, Phillips, uh, Claudia Rankin, and also I want to acknowledge Barbara Meyerhoff, who engaged uh, an early th uh, um, feminist anthropologist who engaged in this kind of speculative writing in her work, Number Our Days, in 1978. Speculative ethnography, a willful methodology. Speculative ethnography is a method that allows you to bend time and space, to be open to alternative possibilities of collective existence, to being vulnerable and being transformed by people who are destined to kill and be killed by one another, then and now to arrive and be on their way again. Come together face to face Conjure into this present moment those you have renounced. Meet and walk with truth at the threshold of emergence in the unknown. Bridge the distance of foreign lands and their people. Defy violence as essential to knowing, being human, being non-human. Venture into another way of knowing. Risk another way of being. Step into moments pre-existing and surpassing our attachments to linear expectations of time and concrete notions of space. 
Hortense Spillers writes, learn to write under conditions of emergency when writing remains the measure of human under the old enlightenment rules. Write in a state of emergency. Write a state of emergency. Write emergency. Write emergency. I attend to her warning, national emergency, national security, global emergency, global security, global war, global terror, global war on terror, enlightenment rules. Bounties issued, hunt down, torture, render Muslim men and children, concentrate in camps, black sites, once hidden, then revealed, secret agreements sealed within international networks of nation states, redact testimonies of torture and extrajudicial killings, secure democracy under occupation, right in a state of democracy. Everything points to an ecological emergency devastating deaths and displacements from the impacts of climate change, pandemics, and war. No one is immune from the vitality of viruses and the force of winds, waters, fires, foreclosures, blackouts, burnouts, borders, and bullets. Tsunamis, desert storms, kill lists, forced migrations, forced separations of families, wave after wave of mass shootings, mass destructions, mass infections, mass incarcerations, mass displacements. White supremacy operates to satisfy an insatiable fear, enabling brutality, denying realities of interrelated ecosystems within which humans and non-humans pre-exist and surpass imminent borders of belonging. Black and brown bodies, hunted, captured, interned, enslaved, disappeared, dehumanized, denied habeas corpus. A will to war, is that not tantamount to a will to prepare for suicide? Witness us and them in the wake of war, secretly sequester their freedom, our will, their determination, our redemption, their perseverance, our perturbations. Global war on terror. They found a cause to recalibrate the priorities of neoliberal democracy and called it terrorism. Enter here. You are invited into a gathering of friends and enemies called to speak with one another about the demand of patriotism to kill and be killed in service of citizenship and national belonging. Listen to each other's stories of struggle, dreams of abundant futures. In for the long haul, the promise of liberation is worth it, they say. This journey invites you to, to fracture, regroup, displace, assemble, disrupt, and reassemble subjects and objects beyond time, where nationalism becomes patriotism, becomes terrorism, becomes what M. Jackie Alexander calls the now of slavery. Enter here. You are stepping into spaces of speculation, willfully transgressing, willfully disturbing the old enlightenment rules of white colonizers, explorers, adventuring in search of documenting exotic others with scholarly traditions, their elders fashioned into what they authenticated and authorized as ethnography. You are in the method. You may be apprehensive about us, them, you, I, we, they, theirs, ours, all fraught theoretically, pronouns, taking space, making place, making moves, making troubles, assuming an intimacy that approaches too quickly, perhaps, claiming to authenticate and wander off again. Subject positions and social locations are fluid here in this place of speculation. You can choose to align with and distance from us, them, me, you, paying attention to what moments, which pronouns draw you in to intimate relationships, and those that push you out, push your will, your willfulness to show up and join the conversation 
in this place called terrorism? Are you willing to defy the conventions of aligning with, pledging allegiance to a singular pronoun, a singular identity, a singular nation, a singular nation state, a singular space, a singular time? Are you willing to be in solidarity with them, us, theirs, ours, they, you, I, we, together, bending rules, transgressing boundaries, crossing lines, breaking limits, surrendering to a way of being and a way of knowing, fraught with potentials of multiple truths, multiple meanings, multiple paths that may or may not find respite or refuge in liberation, revolution, or peace. Journey to a place called terrorism. This is a speculative ethnography of war. It is a methodology that invites you to visit terrorism as a place of colonial encounters. We are departing from the conventional views of defining terrorism as an ideology or a form of political violence by non-state actors, extremists, or quote-unquote irrational fundamentalists who pose a threat to personal, national, global security. When you journey to and inhabit terrorism as a place, the signifier of terror brings into view a range of brutalizing subjects, objects, and practices of war which state regimes and resistance movements rely on to pull us into mobilizing those unifying grand narratives of a particular history and heritage, to pull us in to proclaim patriotic pride and national belonging. As objects of terror, patriotism and nationalism draw on your enduring commitments to racialized identities and subjectivities, which in turn pulls you into a dialogical reproduction of violence, transporting you back and forth across time and space. Tanks and Humvees, airplanes and leaflets become objects of patriotism and national, national belonging, as do the practices of lynching in the past and extraordinary renditions in the present, as do the demanding shove of black water Humvees pushing Iraqi civilians' cars off the road, as do the crushing arrogance of U.S. tanks demolishing entire neighborhoods, producing an experience that is responsive, that calls to soldiers and civilians running alongside and within it, as do chokeholds by policemen killing unarmed black people, as do the execution of children while standing your ground as an expression of neighborhood belonging. Question, how do we know terrorism? Is it the same way we know white, privilege white, supremacy how? Do we arrive a decision? What violence is the work of a terrorist? George Zimmerman stood his ground and killed young Trayvon Martin. Killer acquitted, democracy's lynching, affirming across the nation the sanctity of white supremacy secured in the Second Amendment found Nicholas Cruz his rights to bear arms, killing 17 students. Was that the work of a terrorist, citizen, soldier, insurgent? How do we arrive a decision who is a terrorist who is not who poses a threat to whose lives matter, whose lives we mourn, whose death calls upon our conscience, our compassion, to be whose mother, father, son, daughter, brother, sister, friend, lover, who must live with lives lost? How do we arrive a decision whose lives are guilty, deserving the protocol of torture, deserving the penalty of death. Powerful. Um, I want to almost say stay at the podium um, as we talk about this. Um, I have as a question, you know, something that really came to my mind as I was reading this book and I was thinking about tonight's lecture. Um, I'm overcome with emotion in listening to you read, which is much different than reading myself, right? So I sort of feel that emotional tumult right now as I'm talking. Um, I have here in my notes, um, as we spoke about um, earlier, just that it's 
I think that, this is my point of view, that we are a bit afraid to invoke the word terrorism. And it's not a word that comes easy or spills off our lips in conversation. Even in you and I talking about your work, it's in the title of your book, um, but we don't fully really dig into this word terrorism and what that means, particularly across so many different ways that we experience terror um, as survivors, victims, through racism, through ethnicities, nationalities, religion, um, sexualities. There's um, so much embedded in here. So I raise this, um, this question about the word terrorism and your thoughts on this as it intersects your research and your reading that we've just um, experienced with you tonight, um, the state and nation struggles that are backdrops to your stories and ones that we are part of today. And I'd be remiss to not say that we are attuned to the earthquake um, that just happened in Turkey and Syria, right? And the trauma, um, as you um, spoke about um, um, trauma in, um, in your poetry, um, the trauma that comes with Russia invading Ukraine and what that means um, for both Russian nationals and um, Ukraine nationals, and, and there are multiple other examples, right, that we could um, talk about. I want to be conscious of time. I'm going to invite you to um, go back and um, close your reading, but say a bit more about, about this terrorism and how that comes out in your work. This is really meaningful. This is, um, by way of responding, I would ask us to come back to um, uh, our discussion on redaction. So post 9-11, um, you know, the, the global war on terror is um, now put into warp speed, right? Even though anti-terrorism laws were already in place uh, during the Clinton administration, for example, and they were resonating, like in 1979, there was an anti-terrorism anti law in Sri Lanka. So the language of terrorism, of course, you know, harkens back to the French Revolution and, t um, and the whole um, a c construct of terror as a, as a political uh, tool. So that's a whole other discussion um, that has been in our vocabulary for, for some sure. Time. I mean, I overlooked like one little word in my question, which is that you know it's even more difficult to talk about terrorism since 9/11. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, and 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 because it's become ter ter the, the 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 term terrorist has become racialized. So the rise of Islamophobia. Those of us who who have a particular color of skin or particular markings on our, um, who I've been, I've been assumed to be um, a, a, a Muslim. Um, my spouse, whose heritage is um, Syrian and Lebanese, and uh, he's a, uh, we are a transnational family, and, uh, and the Netherlands, um, uh, his surname is Adela, and he is regularly uh, pulled aside and and scrutinized when we travel and especially when we travel together but also when he travels alone so what's um, so 9/11 um, this is really meaningful because 9/11 is going to be a date that is remembered but what's redacted in our history is another 9/11 that is September 11 1973 for example right when the United States intervened in the democratically elected um, governance of Salvador Allende in, in Chile, and then the violence that, that, um, that unravels from there. Um, similarly, in 1953, where the, the CIA and the United States government um, uh, intervenes in Iran um, and a democratically elected um, governance of um, uh, Mohammed um, Mossadegh that resonates into wars today. Sure. So how we think about what I would ask us um, to think about uh, the, the, the history, not only the history of terror and terrorism, but how it manifests in our everyday lives through the practice of othering, whether it's in our most intimate relationships and then it, 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 it resonates out and ripples outward into our communities. Every act of othering arguably is a form of terror where we inv invoke fear in another person and where we exclude another person. 
Every act of power to marginalize and to dehumanize to other is an act of terror. Sure. And so what I would ask us as, as I continue to read this last segment is what I'm calling attention to by way of answering your question, Barb, is, is to think about our very own, those that we embrace as our soldiers and how soldiers are coming back with post-traumatic stress syndromes that are having to relive and live with the consequences of the work of killing that they have done on our behalf. Sure. Um. As you close with the, the... The next part of your reading. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm drawing on the work of Jane Bennett and um, uh, 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 vibrant matter and vital materialities where she's asking us to understand the force of, uh, of, of objects uh, in relation to um, human actions. Veteran soldier reports from the theater of war. Brian Turner served for seven years in the United States Army. He was deployed to Iraq in November of 2003, where he was an infantry team leader with the 3rd Striker Brigade Combat Team, 2nd Infantry Division. He invites us into the everyday lived reality of US soldiers and civilians in Iraq, making familiar the strange and making strange the familiar. We are accompanying him as he witnesses the vital materialities of actants in the theater of war. And so with a speculative method, I'm inviting you into this moment as Brian Turner invites us into that moment in the theater of war. He writes, on patrol, some of the soldiers piss into plastic bottles and then screw the caps back on tight. As we drive through a small cluster of mud-walled homes, children chase after us with their hands, gesturing for something to drink. I watch the children scramble to recover the piss lobbed their way as some of the bottles roll and spin once they hit the dirt shoulder. Others burst open to vent a spray of urine. War to win. These were the words of President Barack Obama. War to win, that is. Life under occupation. Life under occupation. Under life occupation. Under life. Life. Under life, uh, life under occupation is a condition of liberal democracies that continue to be defined by the legacies of white supremacy and colonial rule. She was eight years old at the time of the 1958 revolution and the liberation of her country from British occupation. From 1917 to 1958, Iraq was seized by the power of white supremacy to invade and occupy the place she called home, Baghdad, Iraq. Life under forced migration and exile into the heart of colonial metropolis, London. From this place, she writes her story. Quote, the US-UK catastrophic adventure has been shrouded by the old colonial phrase, liberators, not conquerors, and by the new imperial lie of establishing democracy. Occupation, Haifa Zangana reminds us, calls us to recognize armed resistance as a right under international law. She says, it is a response to arbitrary break-ins, humiliating searches, arrests, detentions, torture. She joined the Palestinian struggle in the wake of the 1967 war. Like many Iraqi men and women, she could not be a bystander to the injustice and violence of colonial invasion and occupation that destroyed Palestinian sovereignty, Palestinian families, and displaced them from their homes and ancestral lands. 
As a trained pharmacist, she participated in the Palestinian Red Crescent to serve Palestinian families who were displaced from their homes living in refugee camps in Syria and Lebanon. In solidarity with people across the world, she became an activist and writer. In the struggle for Arab unity, the liberation of Palestine, the end of foreign domination, and women's liberation from the tyranny of patriarchal order, Haifa Zangana joined a lineage of Arab feminist writers, poets, scholars, doctors, human rights lawyers, such as Nawal El Sadawi, Nazik Al Malika, and her mother Umm Nizar, Jamil Sidki Al Sahewi, Kasim Amin, Huda Sharawi. Under life occupation, Sister Zangana reminds us they have no need for white feminists to educate or rescue them. They have no need for white liberal democracies to show them the way. During the Algerian resistance, she joined thousands of women in protesting the incarceration of a fellow female Qada who had been detained and tortured by the French colonial regime. She joined fellow Iraqi women in their yearly celebrations of International Women's Day on March 8th and International Workers' Day on, Mar on May 1. She joined the armed struggle against Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath regime. She was detained, imprisoned, and tortured. After her release from Abu Ghraib prison, she left Iraq in 1974 to live in exile. Under life, there is resistance to colonial occupation. There are dreams of going back home, returning from exile, rebuilding a country from the chaos and destruction left in the wake of imperial wars. After the invasion of white nation states, there is life. After redaction, there is willful resistance. Sister Zangana tells us, what the occupiers have failed to see is that Iraqis who have committed acts of resistance are not terrorists. We are a people willing to risk our lives defending our homes, families, ways of life, history, culture, identity, and resources. We do not hate Americans, though we do loathe their government's greed and brutality and are willing to defend ourselves against it. We simply believe that Iraq belongs to Iraqis. So in the following three poems, I'm following the um, poetic form of Lely Long Soldier. The text in the left column are passages excerpted from Haifa Zangana's book, City of Widows, an Iraqi Woman's Account of War and Resistance. The text on the right column are passages excerpted from Brian Turner's memoir, My Life as a Foreign Country. So this is that moment of speculative ethnography where we are entering into this place called terrorism, where Haifa Zangana's words and her lived experiences is in dialogue with the lived experiences of US soldier Brian Turner. So again, the text on the left are excerpts from Haifa Zangana's, and the text on the right are excerpts from Brian Turner. And the redactions I'm imposing uh, myself into the text of the poems that follow. Life under occupation. They sent the most powerful army equipped. Soldiers kick in the doors and enter the house with the latest high-tech weapons and zip tie the men of military age and shush the women, whether in the initial phase of shock and awe and the frightened little children and drink or at later stages using cluster bombs, phosphorus, the spoon sugar stirred into the hot chai and a new generation of napalm called AK-77. 
remove their stinking boots and depleted uranium and other unconventional weapons, take off their flak vests, and in Baghdad alone, stack their weapons and turn off their night vision goggles. And there are an estimated 800 hazard sites. Say to the frightened little children, softly, with the majority related to cluster bombs, their palms held out in the most tender of gestures, thousands of mothers, just like my mother, continue to queue for weeks. They can offer their eyes as brown as the hills on end at the gates of prisons, detention centers, and military camps that lead to the mountains, or as blue as the rivers in liberated Iraq that lead to the sea, waiting for any news about their loved ones. All is well, little ones. All is well. Life under occupation is bleak. We are shelled on close to a daily basis. A dismantled state, a powerless government confined, the enemy is bracketing our position to the fortified green zone, corruption, the absence of law. Basically, an Iraqi mortar crew is day by day and order the resulting chaos makes and round by round discovering the proper distance. The notion of citizenship, here impossible elevation, deflection, an explosive charge necessary to remember armed resistance against occupation is a right. Fire rounds directly into our camps under international law if they adjust correctly. There's a good chance what happened in Haditha has been described as the Iraqi my lie. Motor rounds will explode inside the wire tomorrow and the details of the slaying of civilians contradicted. It's a matter of ballistics. Those from the US military statement range velocity and patience. Eyewitnesses said they were forced into a wardrobe and shot. It's a matter of great patience. Outside on the street, US troops are said to have the rounds land entirely simultaneously, gunned down four students with an overwhelming godlike finality and a taxi driver. They had stopped at the soft architecture of the membrane of the brain, registering a roadblock set up, each concussion as a type of conversation after the bombing. Occupation affirmed. According to an Iraqi member of parliament, there were 1,053 cases of documented rape cases by the occupying troops and Iraqi forces from 2003 until early 2007. Under life, in the fifth year of occupation, soldiers kick sectarian and ethnic divide, zip tie the men, shush the women, politicians, their warring militias, frightened little children, monstrous creators, spooned sugar in the green zone, their stinking boots, not sparing civilians, their prisons stacking their weapons, their morgues saying to the frightened little children, disappeared relatives, all is well, little ones, to bury the dead. Life. Um, good to sort of breathe, absorb. Um, yeah. I have a final question, but I really, we've covered the question that I have, which is really about bell hooks and this notion of 
bringing ourselves into the text, there's also the notion of bell hooks talking about theory helping to heal and liberate us. And there's a little bit of healing and liberation, but maybe not um, in this final reading. But I think what I'd like to do is open it up to any questions that you have. Um, I have a mic that I can pass around. I'm happy to um, talk with you. Yeah, Beck um, actually said that. And Yam Yamana, I also would say, like, if you want to add anything to the um, emotional impact of that last reading, please um, jump in. Um, but yeah, we'd love to engage you. Any questions that you might want to pose um, to our scholar and reader tonight, please raise your hand back. Um, we'll bring you the microphone. Is this, oh, it is on, <laughs> okay. But uh, thank you, first of all, very moving, very emotional, just amazing. Uh, where can you buy this book? <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say very quickly that um, I have here the book that our library owns, so it's um, there to circulate. I'll return it, um, leave it to be returned so that you can borrow, um, so that you can get that. Um, you know, another um, thought that um, Yamana mentioned to me was to get the book in electronic. Um, version as well, and I, um, something I'll take up with the library. But I'll return this tomorrow. Um, go for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you can always go directly to Paul Grave Macmillan, who's the publisher, to purchase the book. Thank you so much <laughs> for your affirmation and your, and your receiving um, and, your, and your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. uh, the book dropped on Amazon um, in January of 22, so you can find it there also. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, and then I'll go on to my actual question Absolutely. but uh, you mentioned a willfulness yes and kind of a uh, in my class I'm currently taking of ethnographic experience we're learning about a willful defiance yes uh, can you explain more of your uh, viewpoint on that absolutely and your name is Emily Emily thank you so much for your wonderful question that um, and say that again uh, willfulness in your in your class you 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 spoke about it you guys are discussing it as willful defiance yes we are reading the book uh, progressive dystopia yes. about the uh, anti-blackness in schooling yes yes beautiful beautiful so you you are hearing an um, uh, an embodiment in in my reading and in my work in my poetry you're reading the embodiment of a willful defiance. You're hearing it, you're feeling it in my body and in yours. This emerges from my own lived experiences of having to confront um, white supremacy here in the United States, in the diaspora as I travel, to confront white supremacy even in Sri Lanka, um, to be confronted by military checkpoints, and to, um, uh, and to understand um, the will to persevere in the, in the midst of being marginalized or being othered. Um, uh, you know, part, of, part of this ethnographic method is, is the recognition of those moments where uh, one is dehumanized. So in various academic settings, um, at colleges that I have taught at, at academic conferences, I've been called a terrorist. I've been called a Patricia Hearst to come back to assassinate a beloved mentor, who in fact ends up being assassinated by the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam in time. So to be called an assassin, to be called a terrorist, and to, and to face that, to confront that, head on um, is an act of willfulness, uh, is an act of defiance that is um, essential to perseverance, that is essential um, to life. Um, in the face of redaction, something else must be revealed. And part of that process of revealing requires the courage to defy. And this is something that Sarah Ahmed writes about so beautifully in her, in her work, Willful Subjects. Thank you, Emily, for your Thank you very much.
It's an excellent question. Oh, but you do. <laughs> you don't think you do, but this room has sort of weird acoustics. In chapter two, you discuss white supremacy being a preeminent foundation of knowledge production. In higher education, knowledge is constantly being sought and produced. As an educator, how do you see white supremacy's monopoly on knowledge production manifested in the classroom and in students, in students' learning experiences? I'm sorry, your name is? Liana. Liana. Liana, thank you very much for your excellent question. Um, really meaningful, huge question. When we look at our curriculum, um, when, we, when you look at your syllabus, and I ask this of my students as well, how do you, um, how do you, how do you recognize the, the, the writers, the authors? Um, uh, are, uh, historically, um, and many students will still come back to say they're predominantly white, they're predominantly male. Um, when we look at liberal arts curriculums, and when we see the separation of religious studies and philosophy, and when we, when we see that the um, philosophers of, um, of the Western canon are lauded and recognized as philosophers, but philosophers from non-white spaces of the world um, are relegated as ritual or, or uh, magic, or you'd have to go to learn about, uh, about Buddhism or Hinduism and the, and the, and the, and the systems of, of philosophical thought in Taoism in religious studies, for example, or in anthropology. So it shows up in the curriculum directly that way. It shows up in our bodies. White supremacy shows up in our bodies. When fact, and Sarah Ahmed also writes about this in another book on being included, um, uh, uh, racism in, um, uh, in, in, in higher education. How, and especially you know, um, in the wake of, of the uh, extrajudicial killings of, of, of uh, George Floyd, Michael Brown, Black Lives Matter, and um, you know, the, 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 the anxiety over diversity and um, uh, becoming awakened to the need to diversify um, our institutions in terms of faculty, in terms of curriculum, and still there is a resistance. And when we recruit faculty into institutions, the struggle is still to understand, to welcome, and to um, uh, have structures in place to not keep us as visitors. So that's, that's part of the embodied experience. The other part is that, um, again, in, in, in my own lived experiences and having spoken with other faculty of color, particularly here in upstate New York, for many students, I am the first faculty of color that they have ever encountered. So I'm constantly having to authenticate myself as a person, as a scholar, as a teacher. And so I've become accustomed to being reported on, whether it is the kind of assignments that I give that requires students to go out and meet and speak with students from other organizations on campus, students of color. And so there's pushback. And so in the age of neoliberal democracies and neoliberal institutions, neoliberalizing education and how we are all becoming commodities and um, homo economicus, as um, Wendy Brown writes about, another feminist scholar, we need to pause and stop and ask ourselves, what is this impulse to report on, to surveil each other? And that becomes part of this realm of war that we are witnessing in our academic life as well. So that's a lot that I'm presenting to you. But this is all within the parameters, within the structure and system of white supremacy that prevails and that defines 
the relationships of power and, the, and how that power structures our education, our curriculum, and our environment. Thank you. Thanks, Siana. Great question. I know a lot of other, uh, I have uh, printed out a bunch of questions, but there's much of that that we've talked about already. If anyone here would like to ask a question, we'd, we'd entertain that first. Hi, um, I've never heard of the Liberation Tigers before. Do you mind uh, talking a little bit about them? Absolutely, and your name is? Miles. I'm sorry? Miles. Miles. Very, very nice to meet you, and thank you for your, for your question. Um, there's a reason why you haven't heard about them, <laughs> the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam. This is part of redacted histories. And this is connecting to um, the curriculum of white supremacy. What media coverage is available to us here in North America versus Europe versus South Asia? How are we socialized to know what is happening beyond our borders? That defines how we see ourselves and how we define our identities our sense of national belonging rests upon our not knowing in many ways. So the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam um, uh, emerged as uh, the leading representatives of the struggle for national self-determination that emerged out of a long history of, of democratic practices by political parties with Tamil um, uh, community members organizing in political parties in Sri Lanka, including the Federalist Party that then transformed into the Tamil United Liberation Front. And in 1978, the, um, there was a referendum in the regions of the north and east of Sri Lanka, the historical homelands of the Tamil-speaking community members of Sri Lanka. And um, the referendum came back with a call for national self-determination, which is the creation of a separate state of Tamil Ulam. The response by the government was uh, state-sponsored violence in the form of states uh, uh, establishing states of emergency, which then allowed for the government to deploy um, military uh, 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 forces to the north and, th and east, and then um, uh, that became a form of uh, military rule in our neighborhoods. And with the um, combination of um, uh, constitution, uh, discriminatory constitutional legislation like the ones that I mentioned earlier, um, the language policies, and included in that is the denial of citizenship and the denial of franchise, the right to vote, which means that you can't um, own land and you can't um, uh, politically mobilize, you can't run for office, um, uh, and political parties were then disbanded. So there's a long history of how an entire community based on our identity, our language, were erased, were redacted from a nation state of Sri Lanka. So what emerged, and especially as students were denied education, um, denied uh, rights to higher education, the lack of mobility, the lack of access to uh, uh, professions and jobs, they mobilized to form an arms resistance. So students like yourself, faculty like us, suspended their studies, their scholarship, to join an armed struggle, not knowing what the future holds, whether there would be liberation or not, but for their future generations. At one point, there were over 36 Tamil nationalist movements just in this small region in northern Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is about 25,000 miles in extent, square miles in extent, roughly the size of West Virginia, but a, with a population of over 17 million. It's a small space, right? So students emerged because they had no choice. When you take a language away from a people, we have no identity. When you, when you occupy their territories and make them go through military checkpoints, 
Well, it's similar to the segregated neighborhoods that we live in here in Rochester and how the police, police, that, those are different points of, th those are different kinds of checkpoints. So when we think about armed struggle, we, we want to make sure and connect it to our lived realities here and how we, our identities, our sense of belonging to a community, whether we are recognized as citizens or not, and how that resonates against our sense of belonging or not belonging or somewhere in between. So the Tamil nationalist movement then, there was a lot of infighting and there was a lot of um, internecine violence within the, within the Tamil community. It was brutal, it was awful. There was a time where India also intervened. And the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ulam, as I understand it in my own analysis, made a, 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 a fundamentally game-changing choice to deploy a suicide bomber to assassinate the uh, Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi. From that time, then India intervened into the war in Sri Lanka. My mom was caught in that war. There was a time where we didn't know that she was even alive for a year, we didn't know. And she made it through. They lived in refugee camps, you know, uh, which was our, our neighborhood temple, 50,000 people, three bowls of rice, three latrines, that kind of thing. Our family has lived through that. I've gone through military checkpoints, this close to being raped, this close to being killed. So people joined the, the armed struggle, risking their lives, fighting each other. Fast forward, what ends up happening is that the Sri Lankan government was able to recruit, um, and I write about this in, uh, in a chapter called Muli Vaikal with the, with the title Run Like Hell from Pink Floyd, um, where it was a devastating and brutalizing um, genocide of uh, the Tamil community members in the so-called last phases of the war in 2009 and the liberation tigers of Tamil Ulam, the movement, the leadership was decimated. And now um, in the wake of that, uh, the decimation of the movement, there is uh, an ongoing uh, struggle in the Tamil national, in the Tamil diaspora to continue um, a struggle to recognize the right to self-determination. And, um, and that uh, struggle continues in the international context. Thank you. Sure, Grace, I'm gonna say that we'll close with Grace's question and then if anyone wants to linger and talk with our guest lecturer, I'm sure Yamana would be happy to stay. Um, Grace, thank you so much. Okay, so an ongoing issue between theorists and activists is the making of theory to be applicable to real life. Wait, can you start again, Oh, Grace? I'm so sorry. An ongoing issue between theorists and activists is the making of theory to be applicable to real life. Theorizing can only take one so far, and often these lofty explanations can feel isolating to the general population and intellectual discourse. Is there any room in your analysis of the ways in which war has been normalized and the way it intersects with nationalism, terrorism, and patriotism to make it more applicable to practice Excellent question, Grace. This is one of our this is one of our challenges. And again, Bell Hooks writes about this. Um, Irma McLuhan, um, uh, Faye Harrison, um, Nancy Shepherd Hughes. We, as scholars, our uh, our work is to theorize, to make sense of our world, to build uh, the tools of analysis. How we communicate them becomes a part of our ethical responsibility, which is what you are speaking to. I'm someone who finds theory extremely sexy. I love theory. Um, I <laughs> love reading. <laughs> exactly. I love reading theory. Um, currently, I'm, I'm, I'm soaked in the work of Lauren, uh, uh, of Lauren Berland. And, um, and her work is just so beautiful and, um, and extremely theoretical. And our ethical responsibility 
And our call to action is to make those tools of theory accessible to community members as a form of building solidarity. So as, as a scholar, Grace, our work is grounded on that ethical call to action. When we theorize, we, don't, we need not censor ourselves. And we need to provide access to those tools that we are building. This is what Bell Hooks calls for. And I've found that poetry, as you've heard in my reading, allows us and creates the space and creates multiple portals through which we can walk through, swim through, dance through. And it allows us to also theorize not just with words, but with sound, with soundscapes, with sentiments, with touch, with movement. So I think we are one of, the, well, I think one of our um, crutches that we hold on to as academics is um, our attachment to the word or to words or words that we produce. As we were creating as our, our choreography together, and as I was building the PowerPoint presentation and what, you know, which, which excerpts to choose, and it's like, oh, but that's so good. Oh, no, no, that's so good. Oh, I can't take that out. No, but I want to share this. <laughs> because we, we become so attached to what we have written. So I think what, you know, as I'm speaking out loud and thinking out loud with you, Grace, I think what I'm also um, as I'm maturing, hopefully evolving as a writer, as a scholar, as a poet, is to really pay attention to different ways of theorizing and how, um, um, uh, and Sarah Ahmed talks about this, how we can queer knowledge production. Yeah. <laughs> What a great answer and what a um, great way to close tonight. It is um, sort of full circle, right? The importance of theorizing our lived experience, the meaning that we bring to the text, the meaning that the text brings to us. Um, and I love the idea of theory being sexy and queer, right? Um, in one sentence. Um, so Yamana, I want to close by um, just recognizing your work again. What an extraordinary piece of scholarship and what an honor it's been for me um, to invite you to our campus and to have you speak with us tonight. And even more of an honor for me to be able to invite my students into the fold of this and just immense gratitude. Thank you Please so much. Please join me in um, congratulating Yamana. And please linger if you would like to um, chat her up. We'd be happy to entertain that. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Barb. And thank you, Beck. Thank you, everyone. Mike, your crew. Um, thank you, students. I, uh, your, your questions are wonderful. They're so meaningful and are so um, encouraging me to carry forward with, uh, with this work. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll just happy a to talk with you. Thank you. Just another shout out to Mike um, and the tech um, crew here tonight because we're so grateful that uh, talk stream. That's going to live out on YouTube so you can listen to it again if you want to. Um, thanks again.